The Bane Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, a case from the files of Easy Novak and the winners of the Jim Bain Memorial Short Story Award Contest. Plus, we continue our ongoing audiobook serialization of Timothy Zahn's Cobra, all right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour. It's a pleasure to have you along. I am Bain Associate Editor and your podcast host, David Afshirod. This week, Griffin Barber sat down to discuss the Jim Bain Memorial Short Story Award winning stories for 2022. For those unfamiliar with the award, for over a decade, Bain Books has partnered with the National Space Society to sponsor the award, which honors the best in near future positive science fiction. For the discussion, Griffin was joined by contest founder and judge William Ledbetter, as well as this year's winner, Elaine Midco. Also joining the discussion were second place winner, Pierre Alexandre Sicart. I hope I've said that correctly. And third place winner, Larry Lang. All that in just a moment, but first, the news. Head on over to Bain.com to read this month's free short fiction, a new short story featuring private detective Ezekiel Easy Novak titled Trouble is My Business. Detective Ezekiel Easy Novak didn't normally like going into a case quite so blind, but when he's called out to the agricultural zone to visit one of the wealthiest men on Nova Columbia, the payday made it worth his while. It seems Felix Conrad's son is missing, and so is a valuable artifact from his vast collection of antiquities. Now it's up to Novak to find them both before a radical group of cultists intercept them. That's Trouble Is My Business by Mike Coopery, free to read right now at Bain.com. Hi there, I'm Griffin Barber, your host for today's edition of the Bain Free Radio Hour. Today we'll be discussing the Jim Bain Memorial Short Story Contest with William Ledbetter, Elaine Midco, Pierre-Alexandre Sicard, and Harry Lang. A little bit about the award first. Since its early days, science fiction has played a unique role in human civilization. It removes the limits of what is and shows us a boundless vista of what might be. Its fearless heroes, spectacular technologies, and wondrous futures have inspired many people to make science, technology, and spaceflight a real part of their lives, and in doing so, have often transformed these fictions into reality. The National Space Society and Bain Books applaud the role that science fiction plays in advancing real science and have teamed up to sponsor this short fiction contest in memory of Jim Bain. Hello and welcome all. Hello. 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 Oh, yeah. Uh, I can wait what I want everybody. since it's a radio show and not, uh, and nobody will see the video that uh, my waving and uh, they'll, they'll see the video as well. It'll go up as well. It goes up uh, uh, simultaneously or shortly there oh. up on YouTube. So, yes, that fabulous. Uh, <laughs> wait until I get to my hairdresser first, then I'll be back in two hours. Yes. So uh, before we go uh, into the uh, depths of each of the individual author's stories, uh, first off, William, uh, how did you come to be a judge for the Jim Bay Memorial Short Story Contest? The idea of the contest, I mean, it was my idea for the contest, actually. Um, this was like oh, 2006. Uh, our local NSS chapter was going to host the International Space Development Conference here in the Dallas area. And, uh, uh, and, and being, being a writer, I was I was trying to come up with something unique and, and a little different than uh, the other ISDCs had, and I thought the idea of a short story contest would would be fun, you know, and uh, just do, doing short fic, you know, short stories uh, about you know man's near future in space, and uh, um, it, it was intended in the beginning to just be a one off thing, um, but anyway, I knew a couple people at Bain, so I uh, I, I tossed out. Uh, you know, I, I tossed out the idea to them. Apparently, it went all the way up the chain, and Jim Bain liked the idea as well. 
Um, and uh, so they said, yeah, let's do it. Um, so that's how it was born. Um, it was odd though, it, 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 the, the contest started, um, we started getting all of our entries and everything in, but, but Jim Bain actually died before the contest was over. So, uh, you know, it was, it was kind of an odd timing thing. Um, so yeah, I was, I, when you said 2006, I was like, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> uh, and so that's how the National Space Society came to support it was that you kind of let them know that was, that was kind of one of the things that. Well, you know, they were, uh, we were kind of running it for our ISDC, but after Jim died, uh, Tony uh, Weisskopf contacted me and says, hey, uh, this, this, was, this was very successful and, and we we're very pleased with how it turned out. And we were looking for something uh, to be kind of a, a, a memorial type uh, thing for Jim Bain. And we were wondering if you'd be willing to do this every year and if, if the uh, NSS would be willing to, uh, you know, be a co-sponsor every year. So I contacted their director who was George Whitesides at the time and uh, um, we discussed it and it's like, yeah, it's like, you know, the, the, the only thing that we want to make sure is if we're gonna uh, be a co-sponsor is that the contest is, is, is in the short term. I mean, you know, like uh, the near future, um, you know, we don't want any, you know, galactic, uh, you know. Uh, Empires. Empires and, and, and things like that, uh, you know, a bunch of alien uh, planets at war. And so we want we want to see how we're going to explore the solar system. And so that's that's pretty much what locked that into being part of the contest. So, so in, in that regard, what does a judge look for in this award? Uh, and is there anything that's like a complete deal breaker for you? Yeah. Well, you know, I think one of the things um, is uh, I mean, it's easy to tell a story about, you know, asteroid mining or, or, or something happening on the moon. Uh, but I think in order to stand out from all the other entries, um, you have to show something a little bit different. Um, and I think all these, you know, these writers here and most of the writers who win, uh, they manage to come at these, the, this idea from a different perspective. And, uh, and, and that makes it more interesting um, than just your typical you know, a uh, mining ship in the asteroid belt and something goes wrong and we fix it. You know, it's like, we, we need a little more than that as we get a lot of those. So it, it, it needs to stand out in some way. Um, and really what kind of is the deal killer is, is you said it a hundred years in the future and it's just an automatic rejection. It, you know, we're, we're serious about that, uh, that near future aspect. And a lot of people kind of slip, you know, try to slip things by and it's like, well, you know, yeah, I honestly believe that there's going to be a human, you know, empire with 20 planets within the next 50 years. And it's like, yeah, that, that's not going to work. <laughs> so uh, you kind of alluded to it, but how many other stories were there uh, annually or this year before you whittled it down to Midco's Man on the Moon, Seacow's uh, A New Life and Lang's The Rocket Ship of Her Dreams? Did you go round and round on them? Yeah, you know, I I, um, I actually have a helper who helps read through the uh, uh, the inbox, and her name is Michelle Munsler, and she's she's an excellent writer and a good a good judge of uh, of of um, fiction. Um, so basically, what she does is she goes through and weeds out the ones who you know are just really ter terribly written, or the ones that are blatantly uh, you know disregard the guidelines. And we get so many weird things. I mean, we, you know, we get pieces of, of um, you know, screenplays. We get, you know, zombie stories. And this isn't zombies in space. This is just regular zombies. You know? <laughs> so it's like we get all kinds of crap like that that she helps weed out. And, 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 uh, and, and then she forwards the rest of it to me. And then I have to, then I have to narrow it down to, you know, to 10 stories, where in this case, this year there were eleven that ended up going wow. uh, as uh, uh, as the finalists, and um, and that is that is tough. I usually I have a file that I call advanced, and uh, and that one usually ends up in you know anywhere from fifteen to twenty stories, and I have to go through them again, and then sometimes again, and decide on on you know narrow that down, winnow that down to to ten that I can send to the judges, and uh, and of course those stories are all uh, sent without the names or any identifying information, you know, the author names. 
so that the judges um, the story is based on their merit and and basically nothing else. So, well, uh, just a personal note. I mean, I, I'm not sure how they made the decision, but each of the winners was not only on point with the contest direction, as far as I can I can see, but they were all really entertaining. And uh, one or two of them, judging by how misty I got, <laughs> they made it a little dusty in here. I, uh, they're really really good, and and the the level of quality. I've been in a lot of anthologies. The level of qualities is at or above. Uh, most of the anthologies I've been in. So uh, more power to you. And uh, it must've been very difficult to choose uh, on this. Um, so getting from there to moving on to our actual contestants. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourselves? Uh, we'll start with you, Harry. Sure. Um, so uh, I'm a designer for Boeing. Uh, I work on the V-22 Osprey, which is way cool. And uh, that has helped to inform my stories, particularly the rocket ship of her dreams. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's good to be in a, in a techish kind of environment if you're gonna be writing techish stories. So you get tech, you know, you get the terminology, you get situations, you get an idea of the kinds of things that can go wrong. Um, and, uh, you know, so that kind of feeds into, into, into the science fiction. You know, you, gotta, you have to spacify it, of course. But just being around those kinds of people all day really helps to generate the ideas. Very cool. Uh, Monsieur Sicard? Um, not much to say. As you can hear, I'm French. Uh, I work as a copy editor for Examine, a Canadian company. So uh, I work as a copy editor in English. I've been swallowing more than a score uh, style guides. And, and now I, I write when I have time and sometimes I translate stories from English to French or French to English. Excellent. And uh, Ms. Midko. Uh, yeah. Um... I am an attorney, uh, but I've spent about the last 30 years or so uh, teaching at a state college where I teach criminal law and constitutional law uh, in a criminal justice program. And, and uh, my story, Man on the Moon, as uh, folks will see when they read it on the Bain website, is uh, it's, it's about how are we going to have our legal systems and our societies, once we actually stop visiting the moon or visiting outer space and actually end up living there. Uh, it's really about that transitional time. How are we going to transition to that? Um, and of course the main character has to be a female lawyer because everybody knows there should be lawyers in space, that's obvious. And write what you know, correct? Right. Uh, so going from there, I guess we could start with you, Elaine. Uh, what's the coolest aspect of your story for you? Uh, well, there were several cool aspects. I, I don't want to give away uh, spoilers, but I, I think for me, one of the most interesting aspects, when, when I read or write science fiction, I, I like to call it social science fiction. I like to think about what's this new technology, what's this new adventure, but how will it impact society? And for me, a cool aspect of this story was that this was a transitional phase. This was, instead of people just visiting space, they were in transition to living and working there. And how do you build up a society in that situation? Uh, what sort of laws are you going to make? How are you going to get along? Um, so for me, that was a very cool aspect. Um, of course, I had to throw in uh, some violence and things like that so that it's a cool story, but uh, that was the cool aspect. Well, it, as at 20 years of law enforcement here, I, I've retired from being a police officer. So I, I appreciated all of it because, again, the, the aspect of what do we do when we don't have the framework uh, of laws uh, and you know, what's our resources. And so it was very, very cool for me. I, I quite enjoyed it. Uh, how about you, Harry? What was your uh, impetus or the coolest thing you thought of? In the oh, golly. Uh, I don't know about coolest thing, but um, I think I think the thing that really hooks me in, in, a, in a good story and, you know, and particularly the ones I write is uh, looking into the relationships between the people. And I think that was really front and center in, uh, 
in this particular story. And, um, you know, just how situations and adversity and, you know, those kinds of things bring out what's, what's there all along. But, you know, most of the time we're professional, we're polite, we're, we're all those kinds of things that make for a relatively smoothly working society. But put, put people under pressure and then you see what they're really about. So, you know, I, I kind of enjoy working with that sort of thing. Cool. And Pierre? Um, a lot of my stories seem to, uh, to ask about what it means to be human in different uh, circumstances. Um, I mean, uh, we've been human for, well, hundreds of thousands of years at the very least. And we've changed a lot. Technology has changed us. Uh, we live longer, but um, uh, we actually live uh, sicker because uh, I, I won't get into this. But yes, uh, as we evolve, uh, what it means for us to be human evolves too. And that I find that very interesting. It was fascinating. And uh, you approached it with some interesting characters as well. Uh, who are asking themselves that question as well. Both, all three of you, it, it was really fascinating how each of you touched on what it means to be human in the circumstance, because we have a, a, a crime committed in space, we have a, a, a guy who's cutting corners in space, and we have someone who just wants to be left alone and needs to work to do something else. Uh, a gal who needs to be left alone, wants to be left alone and needs to do something else. I, I really, again, all three of these stories were... Yeah, Bill, you must have had a heck of a time uh, judging between which one you wanted to uh, pick as the uh, premiere. Um, oh, yes. So, William, why did you choose Elaine's story over mine? Tell me. Oh, now, here, here's the thing. I choose the 10 finalist stories, but I'm not one of the final judges. So... Um, it's, it's very interesting. A lot of times my favorite story sometimes uh, doesn't end up being the winning story. Mm -hmm. um, some years it is, some years it isn't. So, uh, but I do, it is, it's kind of fun and I, I won't give away too much, but I, uh, I'm kind of in on the, how the sausage is made as, as the judges are discussing it amongst themselves. I'm usually copied on the emails and it goes back and forth and back and forth. And there, there's horse trading involved. It's like, well, you know, I really like this story, but but I like the one that you picked as first. So as long as my story is either second or third, then then I'm OK with this one for be, being first. You know, so it goes back and forth, back and forth. And, and it's easy to see the difference, um, the, the differences that people find in these stories and, and what, you know, how they, you know, how they, the different stories affect different people in different ways. It's, it's really interesting. But but sorry. Can't you can't frame me for this one? <laughs> so, uh, what were the arguments in favor of Elaine's story? What what did they love in it? No, I don't know. I'd have to go back and look. Uh, I'd have to go back and look at the uh, the notes. In a lot of cases, they don't say a lot about you know about the different aspects of the story. They'll just say, "I really liked it," and, and maybe a. And this is why type thing, you know, with a few, a few. Yeah, they're, they're really just supposed to vote, not necessarily tell everybody what it is this that is true. tickled them. Otherwise, it gets into too much argument and it doesn't get uh, chosen. Um, right. So when will you get? Will we get to see it? To read it? So hopefully uh, next month. Uh, it'll all go up uh, at the end of this month or uh, in early July. Um, which character uh, in your tale surprised you, Elaine? For me, it was the main character. Uh, she is uh, an attorney and she very much uh, uh, believes in, in law and in the legal system. Uh, but it, as I was writing the story, you know, I, I got stuck a little bit before I was able to move on and finish it. And, and certainly she surprised me with, again, no spoilers here, so no details, but she made a certain decision that I think was a wee bit surprising and surprising to herself as well. Um, so that, that, that was it, that, that she surprised me with her decision. Cool. <laughs> <All> ambiguity. <laughs> yeah. 
And so, uh, Harry, the same question for you. Which character in your story kind of surprised you with what they did or what the story dictated they would do? Actually, it's almost exactly the same answer as Elaine's. Uh, the, the owner and, and skipper of the ship, you know, a woman who'd been in the Air Force, who'd done all kinds of flight tests and all this kind of stuff and was, was really, you know, just kind of a hard driving, no nonsense, uh, pretty, pretty typical pilot type. Uh, again, I, I don't know who's going to read this story in the future, but I won't give away any spoilers either. But, but her decision did surprise me. And her, her reason for making this decision kind of surprised me even more. Um, you know, it, it, it wasn't arrived at through some kind of logical calculation and bean counting and everything. She just came up against something that she just couldn't make the other decision. And I think that's, uh, I think that's a legitimate motivation. Yeah, absolutely. But it was a surprise. And Pierre? Um, none of my characters surprised me. I know them. They're, I mean, uh, they're obvious for the stories. That's it. The characters and the story just go together. They're meshed together too much. Uh, Harry, can you tell me what you have against people called Sam? Because in um, in the story you've got in uh, Writers of the Future, Volume Twenty Eight, and in uh, the story uh, that one this time the the at Ben, uh, Sam is not, I, I don't want to give it too much of a spoiler, but right from the beginning of the story, we realize he's not a very nice person. There, there are 10 years between those stories and those are the only two characters named Sam I've ever, I've ever had. Um, it, if you're worth, if it's worth knowing, uh, the, the, the Sam in uh, the latest story, uh, Johnny Cash had an old song called Sam, Sam Hall and it's about a miserable guy on his way to the gallows and his hatred for all of humanity. And that's kind of why I named the character that. So that's where that name came from. <laughs> all right. Um, so, uh, Pierre, then if your uh, characters didn't surprise you because they were purpose built for the story, uh, why, how did they particularly come, to, come together for you? I would not say they were purpose built for the story. They oh. go together. Uh, I think the thing is, uh, you don't have a story without characters. All you've got is a setting. Uh, I don't know if uh, I, if it was Austin Scott Card or Brandon Sanderson who said this. I think both of them said it, but we come to fantasy or science fiction for the wonderful setting, but we stay for the characters. Indeed. So uh, your characters came to be how? I did have an idea for the story, uh, and, and there was only one character who could uh, fit that idea. Neat. And uh, Elaine, for you, the, the, I, I'm suspecting there's just like, you know, there's a little bit of right what you know as an, uh, an attorney. Yeah, it's, it's a little bit of that. Uh, and it's also uh, uh, personal hopes and dreams. Yes, I ended up being a lawyer, but my goodness, from the time that I was little, always, always uh, wanted to, to go into space. Uh, wrote to NASA when I was seven or eight years old, volunteering, wow. saying, oh, if you need a kid, take me. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and of course, uh, I may be a grown up now, but that doesn't mean I don't want to go. I want to go. <laughs> Very neat. And Harry? Why not write about lawyers in space? Maybe one day they'll actually send one yeah. just to get rid of them here. Who knows? Know. Have they have they yet? They might have. So, you know, some of these uh, astronauts have like six different careers under their under their belt. So maybe one of them became one afterwards. We'll have to find that maybe. out. I'm sure somebody <laughs> on the Internet will research it and let us know. <laughs> How about you, Harry? Oh, gee. Um I'm sorry. What was the question again? I was listening well, to Lane's answer. <laughs> clearly, clearly, Sam is is somebody you've been around for a, a little while in your head. Uh, yeah. How did the characters kind of come to be in your in your head? You talked earlier about your experiences at uh, Boeing and kind of you know uh, experiences yeah, sure. how people react to pressure. Well, I mean, you know, you just know people in life, and you know people from from reading. And um, I, I happen to know one or two military pilots. Uh, so, you know, I kind of have a, 
an inside track on some of that kind of thinking. Um, you know, and, and, and the characters get built around the story. What do you need for the story? I think, you know, Pierre was talking about this a little bit. And so they, they kind of grow. You start off with, with, well, it's a spaceship. It needs a crew. It needs this, it needs that, it needs the other thing. And as the story develops, well, so do the characters. And, and right. you start, you know, writing out little outlines and things about their character and what goes on in their heads. And they kind of just grow before your eyes. Cool. Uh, so uh, I've always felt that near future stuff was has to be the hardest to write. And I congratulate you all on giving us extremely plausible stories that evoke our possible uh, futures in space. Uh, how'd you come to write for the contest? Harry? Hmm. Um, I have to be honest with you. I don't, I don't remember the first time I encountered the, I think I was just looking around for markets and um, you know, I, I was looking for competition specifically because competitions can really sharpen your focus. And that's, that's why I continue to submit to Bain is because it gives me something to focus on. Um, Cause I, like most of us, maybe I, I guess I have like a wide range of, settings and worlds and characters and all these different kinds of things going on and i really needed to kind of settle down into some kind of a groove so yeah i just kind of bumped into it looking around for for venues cool elaine um i don't recall how i heard about the contest uh but i know that once i read about it uh it's it's the first time that i wrote specifically for a themed contest uh simply because i love the theme. Uh, when, when, when you watch, uh, I, I love that it was supposed to be somewhat hopeful, that it wasn't supposed to be, you know, end of the world or anything like that. And, and for me, when you watch news today, it's so filled with so much horror or corruption or terrible things. Uh, but then lo and behold, there's the Mars rover landing or they're growing plants out of lunar soil or there's this beautiful photograph from one of the space telescopes. And all of a sudden it's like, oh yeah, there still is a chance. We can still do something. Uh, so I love the theme. I love that it was near future uh, because I have, you know, I just hope that I live long enough that I get to see some of these things. Uh, so it, that's what attracted me was the theme of it all. And you, Pierre? Uh, Natal Karoshak um, is an excellent writer of uh, near future science fiction. She actually wrote uh, a story uh, that became eerily true just one year after she wrote it. It, it was a little scary. So, so she knows a lot about this. And uh, when she read my story uh, as one of my uh, beta readers, uh, she said, oh, you need to send this one to Ben. That's exactly what they're searching for. Cool. I didn't catch the name. Her name? Yeah. Natalka Roshak, N-R-M Roshak, R-O-S-H-A-K. Cool. So the, the story I was talking about is actually uh, free now on her website. Neat. All right, we'll have to take a look for it. Um, so I really dug the protagonists in each of the stories, and we talked a little bit about characters, some of whom are experts in space and travel or some other specialization useful to space travelers. Uh, again, where was it, uh, aside from the uh, or a case of write what you know or something else, um, was, aside from the protagonist, did you have a favorite character or an individual in the story that you kind of, you, you think maybe uh, you'd like to pursue again in, in the future? Go ahead, Pierre. Um, my story could be continued. Yes, it's it ends, but uh, I mean the what is interesting is the universe itself and uh, where the main character can develop from there. Uh, both the main character and uh, the what we could call the uh, secondary protagonist Kina. Uh, could still be developed further. They still have, uh, they could still have a development arc. It's possible. Yeah, I, I would like to see a novel of, of their further adventures. Um, so, uh, and Harry? Uh, aside from the protagonist, um, any one of the characters really, uh, I, especially 
liked the the engineer aboard the ship. You know, he's I can't really say he was the conscience of the story. He's just kind of reminded everybody about having a conscience. Uh, and I think that's going to be really valuable in the years ahead in space um, as we kind of pursue all the, the technical solutions to things and, and start making kind of ethical calculations about things. I think we're going to need people who, who are you know, firmly rooted in some kind of unmoving ethics and morality. So you know, is, yeah, isn't, that a, uh, isn't that a thought experiment or an ethics experiment, the lifeboat? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so that's cool. <laughs> Uh, and Elaine? Um, I, I guess I, I kind of, I, I very much agree with what Harry just said. Um, in my story, it's not so much a singular character, but uh, there are workers in space, but they aren't the astronauts or the engineers. Once we really get out there, there's going to be somebody who's making sandwiches behind the deli counter. Uh, there's going to be uh, somebody who's running the inter-office mail and delivering things. Um, and these are going to be the ordinary people, the very ordinary people. I, I, and, but who are go who's going to be these ordinary people who choose this extraordinary life and say, I want to go out there. I want to be the first one there. And I'm willing to do it even if I'm the clerk at the grocery store. Uh, on the orbital station. I want to do that. And I love those people. And I, I definitely would want to explore them a little bit more. Yeah, it's it, not necessarily the explorers, but the, the first settlers, the first that decide that they're, you know, they're going to go out there and risk it all on the line, put it all on the line. That's, that's a very interesting idea as well to kind of pursue uh, down the road. Um, in a similar vein, which character from your story would you want to avoid like the plague and why? <laughs> well, as, as you mentioned, and again, no spoilers, uh, my story does involve a rather serious crime uh, that occurs in space. Um, I'll, I'll simply say that once you read the story, you'll know who you want to avoid. So <laughs> I won't go into that anymore. Yeah. They're all and Krishna, but they're basically just mentioned in, in passing. Right. Yeah, like, like Elaine, I, I, I think I made it pretty clear in the story who, yeah. who you want to avoid. So. <laughs> right. Yeah, Pierre's story has a little bit of a, a absence of a, a, an antagonist. It's much more uh, versus the environment kind of thing. So it's, it's a little probably a little more difficult for him to choose a, a a character that wouldn't be his to, to kind of hang around with, I would imagine. Um, and which character would you want as an ally? Like is somebody to champion you or, or help you out? Uh, Harry, we'll go ahead and start with you again. Um, again, I, you know, they all developed, except for the antagonist, they all, they all developed in a way that uh, was very satisfying and um, I'd be happy to, to know any of them. But I think the real catalyst for the decisions and the change in direction was was uh, Salazar, the engineer, and um, you know he got kind of dumped on by people. <laughs> you know he was, you know, people didn't really give him the respect he was due. But you know you see that in life too. Some of the people who have the best answers and uh, are the people who are kind of overlooked. And so I, I think I'd want Salazar on my side. And Elaine? Uh, there, were, there were a few, but certainly uh, one character is the fellow who's in charge of uh, that particular uh, spot where the story occurs. And he's sort of a man for all seasons. He, 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 he would be a good guy to have uh, on your side. Um, so he, he'd probably be pretty good, but there were other ones as well. And Pierre? You know, there are not that many characters, but um, I cannot tell more without spoiling the story. Right. That's true. That's always a challenge with this, uh, this kind of format is we don't want to give away too much, and especially in a short story, given that there's probably going to be a limited cast and that kind of thing. Um, yeah, that's the, that's the thing. You cannot have a big cast in a short story, otherwise it gets 
every which way. It's no longer a short story. It's a novella, right? Uh, is there any locations in your stories that you would like to live in or visit? I think we already got Elaine's answer uh, in as much as uh, oh, yeah. he definitely wants to go out there. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'll, I'll, even go, I'll even go on the vomit comet if they'd let me, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Might be a prerequisite to go anywhere you want to go. That's right. That's right. How about you, Pierre? <laughs> well, my father is a computer engineer and uh, he worked on satellites for uh, Astria, which at the time was called Matra, and uh, worked uh, on the Ariane rocket. And so since I was a kid, I, I wanted to go to space but the closest i went was space camp it's ahead of me i haven't been able to do that me too <laughs> very cool the, the thing when i was a kid we still thought that uh, we would go there that we would be there and in and in because there was a time uh, uh, during the uh, before the moon landing when a lot of money was invested in uh, in space travel, in space exploration. And, uh, but after we landed on the moon, hey, done, we've done it. No money to go anywhere. Uh, and uh, the only person uh, who is taking it seriously right now is Elon Musk, who is a very controversial person. I'm not going to discuss him as a person, but I, th I think he's, he's right. We, 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 are, we need to, uh, we need to go, we need to spread. The first time I saw that notion was in uh, Ender's Game, where they made the point that uh, uh, we cannot have all our eggs in the same basket. If we want humanity to survive, we need to spread to other planets. Uh, Mars would be probably first, but then we need to go to other, uh, to the solar system, because otherwise, at some point, there will be an asteroid or there will be a supernova and will be all gone. Definitely so. And uh, <laughs> <to inquire. laughs> yeah. that, that's, that's tough to follow up after. Um, but um, there are basically there's only two locations in my story. It was aboard the spacecraft and then aboard the research station. And I'd take either one. Um, you know, I've been around a while. Watched watched Gemini flights. Uh, that that should tell you. So. Um, and yeah, I've always wanted to go. So however I could go, that's what I would want to do. Very cool. Uh, how about you, Bill? For the settings of these, uh, these would you, was there any place you would want, like to go from any of the three uh, locations? Um, yeah, I think maybe, I mean, you know, everybody wants to go to the moon, but, but I, think, I think Harry's story, you know, with, uh, you know, with, with the ship and, and, and the sun and, and the whole thing. I, I don't know, I, I kind of like the, the excitement aspect of that, uh, the adventure type aspect. Yeah, and for me, so, one, yeah. of the, one of the things that I liked about it was the privatization aspect. Yes. yes. You know, a ship that's been decommissioned is now uh, available for sale to you know, a private person. I, I thought that was really cool. Um, and that is a really hopeful kind of sign, right? That the, a private citizen might be able to go ahead and do this, uh, you know, even without the resources that uh, uh, a person like Musk is being uh, is able to bring to bear to the to the problem. So that's really cool. Um, so, uh, kind of our second to last question here: uh, What, aside from its uh, raw entertainment value, do you hope readers will carry with them long after reading your story? Elaine. Uh, hey. I guess for me, it's it's the realization that it's that getting into space isn't just going to be the science and the technology of it, but we're going to have to consider the social aspects. We're going to have to consider uh, what part of our society do we want to take with us? What part do we want to leave behind? What do we want uh, to change? What do we want to keep? And you used the phrase before, it, it's like, uh, like in the olden days when, when people set out from their homeland to start colonies and, and you know go on ships across the ocean not knowing exactly where they were going to land. Well, they had to figure out their society along the way. And, and we have to be careful how we do that. And also what will be the relationship between those places 
if we have an uh, if we have a permanent orbital space station where people actually live, what's going to be their relationship to Earth and to Earth laws and to Earth rules and what will they agree to and what will they not agree to? So, and for me, that's an interesting aspect. Harry, um, I guess the same kind of thing that I tend to re. re you know, take with me from other people's stories. Um, you know, I, I purposely set this story up as a, as a, as a pretty conventional standard science fiction uh, situation um, because I, I, I wanted that to kind of be the background for the characters. And what I tend to res remember from stories that really get something across to me is the characters. And, and you know, I, I hope people would take away the kind of growth that takes place with these characters, but also how much they, they really needed each other. They didn't need each other just because it took that many people to run the spaceship. They, they all brought something to the table that, you, you know, defined them as, as human beings, because I'm concerned with what makes humans human, and also allowed them to, to, to get through the situation basically with clear consciences. So, uh, you know, that's kind of what I would like people to take away from it. And yeah. Well, as I said, uh, this story is a lot about what makes human human. Uh, it's it's set in the future and uh, it abstracts a lot of uh, uh, a problem that is uh, very. Uh, it uh, it allows to to get a, a detached point of view on problems that are still plaguing our society nowadays. If you look at history uh, for, uh, for a very long time, uh, the, um, the Catholic Church said that women don't have souls. And um, people of color that mm, don't have souls either. So it's okay to do whatever you want with them. Uh, and uh, the problem is we still have a lot of that nowadays. We don't discuss the soul part, but we act the same as if uh, some people had less soul than others. But I should say that the person who's written the best story on this topic is Harry in uh, My Name is Angela. It is a story on uh, what makes you human of what the soul is and everyone should go and read it because that's one of the very best stories I've ever read. Uh, I'll just say I also read Harry's story. My name is Angela and I thought it was fantastic. I agree with Pierre. It was a beautiful story. Uh, and, uh, which, which writers of the future is it in, Harry? I forgot. What's the number? 28. 28. Same as and, Bill's story. And Yes. Yep. Bill's story as well. Okay, Rings of here. Fire, I think. Yeah. Rings, Rings of, of Mars. Mars. I'm sorry. Rings of Mars, which is also great. So wow, yeah. what a great volume to buy. Yes. And Bill, your uh, your take on what you would hope the the uh, the readers will take away from uh, these uh, winners of your competition? Well, you know, I think one of the things that um, well the one thing that we're, we're constantly trying to uh, promote is is kind of a positive uh, view of, of exploring our solar system and, and space exploration in general. Um, but I think what these three stories shared is, is they all kind of had uh, these kind of moral and personal choices uh, that that the story revolved around. And, and I think I think that is incredibly important. Uh, I mean, you know, I mean, it, 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 it gets to what we've been discussing, the core of what it is to be human. You know, it's like you, you make these decisions and, uh, uh, and then you have to accept, you know, the responsibility for them. And uh, I think all three of these stories did that really well. Um, and they also, you know, did really well that, you know, the, the main goal of, of, of getting these stories out there is to show different aspects uh, of a positive future for humans in space. So, yes, definitely mission accomplished in that regard. 
uh, all three of the stories are exemplars of, of good a good storytelling and b neat uh, cool science fiction uh, based near future tales so i'm very much looking forward to being able to uh, see them up on the website and and uh, being uh, having other people start to comment and talk about them as well um so uh, that's it for the the general questions of, of, about this but i uh, wanted to give each of you an opportunity to tell us where you can be found uh, in the near future, if you're going to any conventions, uh, if you have any uh, work coming out with other publications, uh, that kind of thing, uh, please let us know. Uh, we'll start with uh, you, Pierre. Well, I live 12 hours from New York. Uh, that's quite a jet lag. And if I wanted to go to a convention, it would take me about uh, 24 hours to go there, 24 hours to go back and uh, to come back and um, and the boatload of money. So, so I don't get to go to conventions. I, my next story is actually a translation of a story by Orson Scott Cab, which will be published in a Solaris, which is the oldest surviving um, public magazine about science fiction and fantasy in uh, the French language and happens not to be in France, but to be in Quebec. I'm sure they're very proud of that too, given their propensity to think that uh, Quebecois is the, the true inheritor of how to speak French. They, they uh, like actually, historically, it is, it yeah. is. The uh, French people tend to make uh, fun of uh, Quebecois French because it sounds weird to us, but historically, it's uh, much closer to what was the proper French, the French of the court, while the uh, Parisian French came from uh, the, you could say, uh, the, the dialects of, uh, of, the, um, of, of Paris, two dialects right. of Paris, because Paris had two dialects, not just one. So it's, it's, like, it's like the correct English nowadays would come from Cockney. If you want. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, that's a bit of a change. <laughs> uh, so you have the translation. Is there anything original that we can expect from you? I, I really, really enjoyed your story. Uh, I just want to say that uh, A New Life was really cool for me. And I, I meant that when I said about wanting to see a novel out of it, because I think it has legs uh, and would really be cool. Um, so is there any chance of that for this this fan? Uh, I'd rather my story had wings than legs, actually, or, or maybe a, a couple of uh, iron propulsors that uh, yeah. had a couple of iron drives. That that would be nice. Right. Uh, I need to make more time to write in my life. I uh, there uh, there is a very famous uh, commencement speech by Neil Gaiman who says, uh, "Keep your eyes on the mountain. Keep your eyes on your main goal," and I. I saw it very, very late. And uh, I realized that all my life, I had the mountain at the, in the corner of my eye, but I was looking at my feet. I was looking at, oh, I'll, yes, yes, I, I'll do it. But first I need to have a good job. First, I need to get this secure. First, I need to get my PhD. And uh, why not? So in the end, uh, I always had, a reason to postpone what was actually the most important in my life. Uh, there is a big difference between what is urgent and what is important. And sometimes it can be hard to balance. And sometimes you focus so much on what is urgent that what is important just vanishes from your life. Very true. Uh, and Harry, I hate to pick on you, follow that up. <laughs> <laughs> Well, cons are really difficult for me uh, due to some personal commitments. Um, so, I mean, if somebody wants to have a con at the high school down the street, then that would be great. Um, but um, so I, I probably won't be showing up at conventions. And I just, it really, it really fried me that I couldn't make it to, you know, the space development convention. I really wanted to meet Gustavo. Uh, you know, he's uh, probably the hardest working man in science fiction, you know, like James, the James Brown of science fiction. He's always publishing stuff um so that's not going to be happening much but um i i do have a story coming out in analog i don't know i don't have a date um but as soon as i know i'll 
tell everybody. Uh, What's the title? Uh, the title is Hot House Orchids. Cool. And that's as much as I'm going to tell you about it. So and, look for that. And you, Elaine? Um, like uh, Harry and Bill, I've, I've uh, I've also been in Writers of the Future, and I was in Volume 37 that came out last November. Uh, wrote a little uh, space opera story there, so you can find it. Um, I also will have a story coming out later this year in another anthology called Compelling Science Fiction, and that's from Flame Tree uh, Press. Uh, it's also near future. Uh, and that, that was their theme. They wanted near future stories, realistic near future stories. Um, I uh, will have uh, something coming out in daily science fiction, a flash tale that uh, was accepted and also uh, Galaxy's Edge. But I, I don't know when those two, those two stories will come out. And Bill. Bill. Um, yeah, I do go to conventions when, when I can. Uh, I, uh, I'll, be, I'll be at Armadillo Con in Austin uh, at the beginning of August. Um, and I'm also intending to go to World Con and World Fantasy Con. Um, and I, have, I have, a, have an audio book that has been out for a while called Level 5. Uh, it's part of a series called the Kill Day series. Um, and it is actually finally coming out in print and ebook, and that will be out also the first of August. Um, and the only short fiction I have out, I had I had one in uh, uh, not this month's or not this issue of Asimov's, but the previous issue of Asimov's. Um, I had a story out that was uh, called "The Short Path to Light," uh, which was the sequel to. Uh, my story, A Long Fall Up, which had won a Nebula Award several years ago. So um, you might want to look that up if you like the first story. Hopefully you'll like this one as well. So, so. Well, thank you very much for spending some time with me today, especially those of you that had to get up at pre-dawn and uh, caffeinate and short order. <laughs> That's much appreciated. Hey, wait a minute. You didn't tell us why you got into science fiction. Yeah. Well, what are I going to say? I'm kind of like Elaine. I've always uh, dreamed about uh, space and science fiction, a, a lifelong fantasy uh, gamer, etc. cetera. Um, it, uh, when I lived overseas in, in Europe and uh, spent some time there, I, I, I went, used to go to the English language bookstores and try and find stuff because my French wasn't good enough in the reading. My Spanish wasn't good enough either. So I, you know, uh, I've been a huge fan and uh, spent a lot of time alone to being a third culture kid. Uh, I would uh, spend some time alone with my thoughts, as it were. And uh, so I adopted it and uh, I always wanted to write. And now I'm living the dream, as they say. But what again, games did you play? What's that? What, what games did you play? You said you were a gamer. Uh, I'm still playing. I, I'm, I'm actually trying to organize a Delta Green game for uh, Liberty Con, which is coming up soon, which is a lot of a lot of Bane authors attended uh, every year in Chattanooga, Tennessee. It's coming up uh, middle of the month this month. Um, but yeah, role playing games, war games, uh, you know, pretty much you say you name it. I've played it. Uh, so, yeah. But again, thanks so much for coming and, and joining us today. I really appreciate your time and uh, really, really, really enjoyed your stories. Uh, every all of them and again a, a, an amazing job bill getting your judges to decide on uh, a pecking order for them uh, i think it was a it's probably the i don't know if every year it's like this but it was really close to me i i looking at them i was like i don't know how you decided so again thanks so much. <laughs> all right so very good time and uh hope to talk to you soon this has once again been the Bain free radio hour with griffin barber hosting talk to you soon And now we bring you Timothy Zahn's Cobra. Earth's only hope was the Cobras. The colony world's Adirondack and Silvern fell to the troughed forces almost without a struggle. Outnumbered and on the defensive, Earth made a desperate decision. It would attack the aliens not from space, 
but on the ground with forces the troughs did not even suspect. Thus were created the cobras, a guerrilla force whose weapons were surgically implanted, invisible to the unsuspecting eye, yet undeniably deadly. But power brings temptation, and not all the cobras could be trusted to fight for Earth alone. Johnny Moreau would learn the uses and abuses of his special abilities and what it truly meant to be a cobra. They reached the 100,000 hectare test site an hour later, and after giving them new computer modules, extra equipment, and final instructions, Bai turned them loose on their individual objectives. Putting the entire previous night out of his mind, Johnny set to work surviving the exam. It was therefore something of a surprise when, returning to Field HQ from his first successful exercise, he found an MP transport waiting. It was even more of a shock to find it was waiting for him. The young man fidgeting in his chair next to Mendro's desk certainly looked like he'd been in a fight. Heel-quick bandages covered one cheek and his jaw, and his left arm and shoulder were wrapped in the kind of ribbed plastic cast used to speed broken bone repair. What was visible of his expression looked nervous but determined. Mendro's expression was merely determined. "'Is this the man?' he asked the other, as Johnny sat down in the chair his MP guard indicated. The civilian's eyes flicked once over Johnny's face, then settled onto his fatigue tunic. "'It was too dark to see his face well enough, Commander,' he said. "'But that's the name, all right.' "'I see.' Mendro's eyes bored into Johnny's. "'Moro, uh, Mr. Pallet here claims you attacked him last night behind the Thasser Ea bar in Farnsey. True or false?' False, Johnny managed through dry lips. Through the haze of unreality filling the room, a nasty suspicion was beginning to take shape. Were you in Farnsey last night? Mandro persisted. Yes, sir, I was. I sneaked out to try and relax before the final exam started today. I was only there for a couple of hours. He glanced at Palit. And I most certainly didn't fight with anyone. He's lying, Palit spoke up. He was... Mendro's gesture silenced him. Did you go alone? Johnny hesitated. No, sir. All of us in my room went. We split up in town, though, so I don't have an alibi, but... But what? Johnny took a deep breath. About half an hour after I got back, one of the others came in and told me he'd... Well, he said he'd bounced someone around a little behind one of the bars in Farnsey. Mendro's eyes were hard, unbelieving. And you didn't report it? He indicated it was a minor argument. Certainly nothing so serious. He again looked at Palit. Only then did the sophistication of the frame-up sink in. No wonder Viljo hadn't wanted Johnny to change clothes before they all left. I can only conclude that he was wearing my spare tunic at the time. Uh-huh. Who was it who told you all this? Roll on Viljo, sir. Viljo? The one you attacked in the mess hall a while back? Johnny gritted his teeth. Yes, sir. Obviously just trying to put the blame on someone else, Pallet spoke up scornfully. Perhaps. How did the fight start, Mr. Pallet? The other shrugged with his free shoulder. Oh, I made some snide comment about the outer provinces. I don't even know how the topic came up. He took it personally and shoved me out the back door where a bunch of us were standing. Isn't that what you targeted Viljo over, Moro? Mentro asked. Yes, sir. Johnny resisted the almost overwhelming urge to again explain that incident. I don't suppose any of your companions might have gotten a clear look at your assailant, Mr. Pallet. No, no one saw you clearly, but I don't think that's going to be necessary. Pallet looked back at Mendro. I think this story's pretty well lost its factory finish, Commander. Are you going to take action on this or not? The army always disciplines its own, Mendro said, tapping a button on his desk console. Thanks for bringing this matter to our attention. Behind Johnny, the door opened, and another MP appeared. Sergeant Costas will escort you out. Thank you. Standing up, Pallet nodded to Mendro and followed the MP out. Catching the eye of Johnny's guard, Mendro gestured minutely, and the other joined the exodus. The door closed, and Johnny and Mendro were alone. "'Anything you'd like to say?' Mendro asked mildly. 
Nothing that would do any good, sir, Johnny told him bitterly. All the work, all the sweat, and it was about to come crashing down on top of him. I didn't do it, but I don't know any way to prove that. Hmm. Mandro gave him a long, searching gaze and then shrugged. Well, you'd better get back to the testing, I suppose, before you get any further behind schedule. You're not dropping me from the unit, sir? Johnny asked, a spark of hope struggling to pierce the rubble of his collapsed future. Do you think this sort of misbehavior rates that? Mendro countered. I really don't know. Johnny shook his head. I know we're needed for the war, but on Horizon at least, picking on someone weaker than you are is considered cowardly. It's considered that way on Asgard, too. Mendro sighed. It may very well come to expulsion, Moro. At this point, I don't know. But until that decision's made, there's no point in depriving your team of your help in the group operations. In other words, they were going to give him the chance to risk his life, and possibly lose it, and then decide whether that risk had any real meaning or not. Yes, sir, Johnny said, standing up. I'll do my best. I expect nothing less. Mendro touched a button, and the MP reappeared. Dismissed. That was another installment in Timothy Zahn's Cobra, and that's it for the podcast. Thanks as always to audible.com and podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz. Thanks to Griffin Barber, and praise, thanks, and gratitude to Elaine Midko, Pierre Alexandre Sicart, Larry Lang, and William Ledbetter. And good night, Tony Daniel, wherever you are. This is David F. Shirerod coming to you from a soundproof bunker somewhere deep in the heart of Texas. Join us here next week at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy and keep reaching for the stars. <laughs>